If you happen to like humor, I've got a couple notes of humor. I'm not going to be funny, but just notes of humor today in the sermon. And first of all, I'm going to go to the great satirist Jonathan Swift in his Battle of the Books. Uh, Swift, the great satirist, talks about criticism. Criticism. He, he says, a malignant deity called criticism. At her right hand set ignorance, her father, blind with age. At her left, pride, her sister. Now this is criticism. Criticism's sister is opinion. So you got dad, ignorance, mom, pride, and then opinion, her sister. Light of foot, hoodwinked, and headstrong, yet giddy and perpetually turning. In other words, opinion shifts, right, in the world. So that's criticism. Matthew Henry, the great Bible commentator, says this, we ought to be very careful when we blame others because we need allowance for ourselves. Did you know that? Don't be quick to blame others. You need allowance for yourself. If we are of a giving and forgiving spirit, we shall ourselves reap the benefit. Which brings us to the teaching of Jesus in the Sermon on the Level or the Sermon on the Plain. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. With the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. And I can tell you in the passage to which we're about to turn, all these passives about stuff coming back, these are what are understood by Bible interpreters as divine passives. In other words, it's ultimately going to come from God back to you. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Jesus on judgment. Measure in grace. That's Jesus on judgment. Measure in grace, and it's a double entendre. Measure in grace. Be sure you put in a lot of grace into your measure. So let's turn to Luke chapter 6, verses 36 through 42, as we continue uh, to learn from Jesus' sermon on the plain. Let's pray together. Lord, open our ears, open our hearts, our souls to your living word that we might hear, receive, and be transformed as people born anew by your spirit and your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Particularly relevant to our students as we begin a new school season and to parents and grandparents of students as we begin a new school season. Jesus says this, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Pardon, and you will be pardoned. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. He also told them a parable. Can a blind person lead a blind person? Will they not both fall into a pit? A disciple is not above the teacher, but everyone when he is fully trained will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, brother, let me take out the speck that is in your eye when you yourself do not see the log that is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out that is in your brother's eye. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. Judge not. 
and you will not be judged. Now, this is one of the most abused statements of Jesus in all the teaching of the Gospels. Contrary to common misreadings and misuse of this commandment from Jesus that's recorded in Luke chapter 6, verse 37, and what we read as what's marked off as Matthew chapter 7, verse 1, Jesus does not forbid all moral judgments. Let me repeat this. Jesus does not forbid all moral judgments. Jesus is not opening up the door to amorality. There doesn't matter what you do, doesn't matter what anybody else does, tolerate all sin, all evil. That is not what he is saying. Jesus actually calls us to make many moral judgments and to discern wisely according to his word. We are to discriminate between evil and good between right actions and wrong actions. In fact, even in this teaching, Jesus goes on and talks about, we'll get to this next time, Jesus says we're supposed to discern between good trees and bad trees by their fruit. So <laughs> we're supposed to make moral judgments. You know, we are supposed to be discerning. But... What is Jesus teaching us? Jesus is teaching us not to be judgmental and condemning in the hard-hearted, critical spirit of self-righteous hypocrites, which is what legalists tend always quickly to become. Legalists tend to, and this is what religious people tend to be, uh, we start wanting to set up the rules, and then we want to turn them on everyone else. So we're not supposed to be like that. Jesus, in fact, commands us not to be like that. We are not to be like so many of the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious, the highly religious people, the very legalistic people who rejected Jesus' gospel. Instead, what are we supposed to be like? We are supposed to be like gospel grace people people of Christ and of his gospel, his church, the kingdom of God, which is a household of graciousness towards others. That's what he's teaching us. Daryl Bach says, the church, the church of Jesus, is to be concerned about moral purity, but we also should set up opportunities for repentance and restoration. This is what the New Testament teaches over and over again. We should be discerning about the presence of sin, but not judgmental in dealing with sin. To be judgmental is to rejoice in pointing out sin and to refuse to reach out to the sinner to restore him or her to spiritual health. That's exactly the opposite. We are supposed to be gracious, loving, and helping people be restored to the right path. So Jesus says, judge not, and you will not be judged. Let me just highlight this for you. Again, we are in second person plural. Jesus is talking to us together as the church. This is the way we're supposed to guide and help and encourage one another as members of the church. And um, this, the Greek here, what we have is that Jesus' Jesus's teaching is given to us in base form in the manuscripts in Greek, the kind of the international language of its day. The me krinita is a krinita, okay? That, krinos, and kritikos, these are Greek words that source in the English critical, criticism, all those guys. You know these words, right? And Jesus is saying, if you're gonna be my disciples, you're not gonna be people who live in the spirit of criticism. I mean, God forbid, but this often happens with, you know, kind of religious people and church people. They really feed on criticizing other people and criticizing even things that go on in the ministry of the church. Now, are we supposed to be discerning? Absolutely. But if you come into church and if you come into Monday through Saturday with a spirit of criticism, you are not following Jesus. You are working off of another spirit, a deity called criticism. And she's not a good goddess. She is really not. So here we have this issue. Are you going to follow criticism, the malignant deity, or are you going to follow Jesus Christ? Criticism or Christ? 
We all have to decide that. Heading into the school year, we need to make a decision. Are we going with criticism, the malignant deity, who promises a whole lot and feeds us negative energy? Or are we going to go with Jesus, who ushers us into the living God's kingdom? Whom will I follow, criticism or Christ? The spirit of criticism or the spirit of Christ himself? So who is Jesus? Let's remind ourselves now. Jesus says in classic passage where Jesus invites all those who are you know, heavy laden to come to him. Jesus says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. Now the praus there for the gentle is also the same term that's often translated as meek, like in the Beatitudes in Matthew. Blessed are the meek, the gentle, gentle. So Jesus says, look, I am gentle and lowly or humble in heart, so you can come to me. Now, that's great news for us when we want to be saved, right, or when we want to be forgiven. Jesus says, okay, if you're going to come to me, you're going to live in my spirit, and in turn, you are going to be gentle and humble, meek and gracious to other people, including people who are living the wrong way including people who've taken the wrong turns. Should you know better? Should you know the difference between right and wrong? Absolutely. You have to make those, those judgments in that case, but you're not going to be judgmental and high and mighty and hypocritical about it. So Jesus says, be merciful. Okay, I want you to be like me, and if you are with me, you will be born anew as children of the Father, so you'll be merciful just like the Father is merciful. In fact, this is a whole key to understanding Jesus' teaching about how we're supposed to be morally in our character. Like father, like son. You know that saying? Can you all say that with me? Like father, like son. Like father, like daughter. Like father, like son. Like father, like daughter. This is the heart of Jesus' moral teaching for any of us who will be Christians, who will be his disciples. His followers must show the same character as our Father. God our Father is most definitely just, but he is more than just, amen? He's merciful. I mean, you think about it. When, you know, in the, in the famous passage that's recorded in Exodus chapter 34, verse 6, when Moses wants to see the Lord's glory, the Lord reveals his glory and speaks his living word. And what does he say? Yahweh, Yahweh El. The Lord, the Lord God, and what's the first, what's the first adjective? Guess what? Merciful. Rahum. And then Vahagum. Okay? Merciful and gracious. So when God himself, at the heart of the Old Testament, reveals himself, he reveals himself as the Lord God who is, first of all, merciful, did you catch that? And gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. So if we're his children, if we're going to pray God our Father, our Father who art in heaven, then we need to pray that he will renew our hearts, our born-again hearts, in his way, merciful and gracious. So understand this now. The way this happens is not... Again, let me repeat this for us to be legalistic and say, man, I'm going to be the most merciful person in town. I'm going to like just pile up the list and show you guys that I'm right with God. It, you're not going to create it out of your own flesh and out of your own legalism because legalism is going to take you down and it's going to turn you into a judgmental person towards other people. Okay? You're ranking, you're competing. This is, this is not what the kingdom of God is about. The source of our being merciful and gracious is going to be turning to God and turning ourselves over to God. Humbly seeking his way. Humbly not jumping in the judge's seat, okay? But submitting ourselves to him and his spirit of mercy and grace. So when we do, and if you will pray to the Lord about this, How's he going to lead you? 
Well, I have alliterations again today because Dean loves alliterations. I hope he gets it. So I've got, I've got, it's, this is kind of like sometimes in the Proverbs, you'll get like six, no seven, or three, not four, or four, no, wait a minute, five. So I have four, but it's really five because there's a flex one in here too. So these are all M's today. Ready? Here's what you want to do. Mediate mercy. You are going to be a mediator of mercy to other people. Mediate mercy. Measure generously. You knew this one was coming right from the sermon title. Measure generously. Mature, not in being high and mighty, but mature in meekness. In meekness with the master. And then this is my kind of bonus one here that flexes right here in between uh, the main three and four. Make Mary in Messiah's mirth. Make Mary in Messiah's mirth. Jesus is funny. He's got a great sense of humor. Enjoy Jesus. Okay, I'll come back to that. And then uh, mind the mirror. Mind the mirror. That's a very British kind of way of saying it. Look in the mirror, right? Mind the mirror before ministering. Mind the mirror before ministering. Let's, let's unpack these a little bit more. First of all, mediate mercy. In other words, you as God's ambassador, as Christ's ambassador, are a mediator to be priestly in relationship to God your Father who is always merciful, right? Even in judgment, he's merciful, he's gracious. And in dealing then in turn with other people. Be a mediator of mercy, not an executioner of your own judgment. Let me repeat that. Be a mediator of God's mercy, not an executioner of your own judgments on people. Okay? You start executing judgments on people, you have just the ultimate sin of knocking God, supposedly, off the judgment seat and trying to take over your life and your world and your little circles. Don't do it. Don't execute your own judgments. Be merciful. Don't be judgmental or condemning. And pardon. That's the term that's actually used there in the, in the Greek on, that, on this passage. That's why I translated it that. Instead of forgive, it certainly includes forgive, but it's a very specific kind of terminology about like putting out, releasing, okay, pardon. Be patient. This is an old saying. Remember this now. Be patient in living with the faults of others. They have to be patient living with yours. Uh, are any of y'all in a household where you don't live by yourself? Or any of you in a dorm room or a sorority house or fraternity house? Okay, listen to this again. <laughs> be patient in living with the faults of others. They have to be patient living with yours. Remember that. We'll come back to look in the mirror, but that's kind of already the mirror right there in front of you. Uh, number two, measure generously. Give and forgive, trusting God's ultimate grace to you. You don't have to be so snatchy, grouchy, you know, grouchy. Okay, God has more. Your cup runneth over. You're going to dwell in his house forever. God has everything covered. Believe in God. I mean, believe Jesus who is actually who he says he is. Believe in him and then give and forgive. A good measure pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be poured into your lap. Jeremias, the old commentator, um, has this picture of what's going on here with the grain shaken. The measuring of grain is a process, an old process in the Middle East, carried out according to an established pattern. The seller crouches on the ground with the measure between his legs. First, he fills the measure three quarters full and gives it a good shake with a rotating motion to make the grains settle down, okay? Rotating. Then he fills the measure to the top and gives it another shake. Next, we're not finished yet now. Next, he presses the grain together strongly with both hands, packing it in. Finally, he heaps it into a cone, tapping it carefully to press the grains together until there is no room for a single other grain. This is packed full. This is what Jesus is describing about how we're supposed to be merciful. You want to know how merciful you're supposed to be? You're supposed to go through all this, Jesus said. <laughs> In this way, the purchaser is guaranteed an absolutely full measure. It cannot hold anymore. We're packed full. So Jesus says, 
a good measure. He's giving these folks an image they understand. They understand this whole process now. They can all see it as he's speaking to them. I hope you can now, too. A good measure, pressed down, not through yet now, shaken together, running over, Jesus says. I, I don't want you just to do what they do in the market. I want yours, your standard of measure, to run over. And it will be poured into your lap. Now, the term here, this is kolpon, what it means is like the big uh, kind of pocket that's created by the robe, okay? So you can imagine somebody getting this big thing and, and folding their robe over this massive amount of grain, right? And carrying it. That's, that's the way they did. Simple people did back then. Uh, the loose pocket or the bay of the robe is what Jesus is envisioning here at the end. And by the way, the term kolpon is also means bosom. It's like the bosom of your robe. But remember, uh, when Lazarus dies, he goes to Abraham's kolpon, his bosom, right? Um, and Jesus says, for with that standard of measure, the word here, you're going to know the word, is metro. Think about meter, okay? For with that standard of measure, with which you measure, metrete, okay? It's actually, the English translation skips the second one. It just says use, like in the ESV. I'm telling you, it's with the measure, with the standard of measure that you actually measure things, it will be, let me repeat, measured back to you. This is a heavy measure um, statement here by Jesus. And um, it comes back to you. It's, it's coming back to you, baby. It's going to reflect back. Think about the mirror in a different way or the echo or the boomerang here. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Paul says this. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. Do you know that? What you sow in this world you will reap unto eternity. It's, just, it's guaranteed. God has told us this. It's all through the Bible. And we will reap what we sow in accord with the measure that we give. Now, that applies, and of course, in this passage and, and elsewhere, Paul is talking about what we give in our stewardship. I'm astounded with people who like don't, don't understand this basic teaching of the harvest principle of the gospel. This is not, by the way, this is not prosperity gospel. It's just a reality of looking ahead to the judgment. But uh, not only with our stewardship giving will we reap, God guarantees it, now he promises us what we sow, but also in our giving of grace to others. So not only in your financial stewardship, but also in your giving of grace to others. Jesus says, with the measure you use, it's going to be measured back to you. Matthew Henry says this. I've used this already in the introduction. Let me repeat this. This is strong. We ought to be very careful when we blame others, for we need allowance ourselves. If we are of a giving and forgiving spirit, we shall ourselves reap the benefit. Okay, so that's number two. Number three, mature in meekness with the master. Mature in meekness with the master. So not only measure generously, but in this process now from number two to number three, mature in meekness with the master. Follow Jesus, not yourself. It's very tempting to follow my own ideas, right? Follow Jesus, not yourself, and certainly not other blind, blind guides. You're a blind guide if you're not with Jesus. And anybody else who's not with Jesus is going to be a blind guy. Children at school, there are going to be a dozen blind guides that will try to mislead you this year. I guarantee it. Don't go with them. Don't go off the cliff with them. Follow Jesus, not yourself, or other blind guides. And uh, related to this now, here I've got my little flex bonus one in here. Mature in meekness with the master. Make merry in Messiah's mirth. That means Jesus is funny. He has a great sense of humor. Enjoy Jesus. Enjoy Jesus. You know, what do we say in the, the first catechetical question? What's our chief end? What's our main purpose? It's to glorify God and do what? 
enjoy him. You ought to enjoy, do you know Jesus? Jesus is hilarious. I mean, nobody else, no other rabbis are this funny. He's, he's funny. He is seriously funny. You see these pictures he's giving you? <laughs> don't, don't miss, don't go through your life missing Jesus' humor. And understand that Jesus probably has a funny nickname for you too. Seek it out and enjoy it, right? Um, let's listen to this. Can a blind person lead a blind person? Just picture this. I mean, this is not, you know, this is maybe pre-PC, but just think about this. Blind people leading blind people. It's not going well. Jesus is being funny here. Do you all understand this? Don't be all saying, but Jesus is being funny here. Will they not both fall into a pit? And then let's go to round two. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when you've got a log in your own eye? Laugh at yourself, and you need to understand, and I need to understand, we've got logs in our eyes that we might want to address before we go off criticizing other people, right? That's the image Jesus gives us. Make Mary and the Messiah's mirth. Jesus probably lovingly chuckles at some of the things you and I do. Can you imagine that? Think about that in your prayer life, in your daily life. Children, Jesus is funny. Enjoy Jesus. Laugh, including at yourself, unto humility, meekness, and joy. Um, and then, fourth main one, mind the mirror before ministering. In other words, look at yourself, okay, before you go off ministering to other people. This flows out of what we just talked about. Address your own sin before addressing others' sins. That's a commandment Jesus is giving you. Does it mean I'm supposed to, well, I'm always sinful, so I never get to minister to anybody else? No, no, no. He's not saying that, but he is saying, you know, when you start your day, you may want to be in serious repentance before you go try to encourage your brother to be faithful to, right? Address your own sin before addressing others. Uh, address your log before you go off on other people's specs. If even our holy, omniscient Father's judgment is measured and measured again in overflowing grace, how much more should you and I, who have, let's be honest, limited, are we omniscient? Limited view of things. If God, who is omniscient, is merciful, what do you think about us? We better be doubly, triply merciful, gracious, and forgiving towards others. This is Jesus on judgment. He calls us to understand his word in light and darkness and sin and righteousness, but he calls us to do it in a non-judgmental way that is overflowing, measured in lots of grace. And when I say measured, I not only mean the way Jesus is talking about it, I'm saying measure yourself, calm down, laugh with Jesus, ask Jesus to reveal what's going on in your own heart and life, and overflow in grace towards others. This school year, this week, this day. Your Father is merciful. May you and I be merciful also. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org slash give to give.